The election of 2019 was brought to you by my lovely patrons, Thomas Johnson, James Rapp, Lewis, Henry Kerr, and former South Australian Premier Mike Rann. For as little as three Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sormon video, as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content. By 2019, Australia was back in the same position it had been in 2013, with the government barely holding on to power following a disastrous election humiliation. In this challenging environment, could Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull save the coalition government from defeat? Wait, don't tell me. That's it. I quit. Following the election of 2016, the coalition found itself with a single seat majority in the lower house and an even more divided senate than before. This made Malcolm Turnbull's position both as Prime Minister and leader of the coalition shaky. This was shown for the nation to see when the Labour Party defeated the government on a procedural motion in the first week of sitting when several government ministers forgot to show up. Despite Turnbull's weak position, the government would go forward with its proposed same-sex marriage plebiscite on August 2017, and following an overwhelming 61.6% of the response in favour, the government would move to legalise same-sex marriage. To date, this is the last plebiscite in Australian history. While the legalisation of same-sex marriage had gone rather smoothly, it had not gone down well for the more conservative nationals in the coalition, led by their new leader, Barnaby Joyce. This led them to break party ranks and support Labour and the Greens on establishing a royal commission into the banking sector, something the coalition had been blocking for the past few years. This would undermine Turnbull's leadership and the party seemed divided on its policy and things were only about to get worse. Oh boy, I'm going to have to talk about this. Okay, here we go. In late 2016, Family First Senator Bob Day would be forced to resign due to issues with his housing business back in South Australia. This led the Senate to take a deep look into Section 44 of the Constitution, which pertained to Parliament eligibility. This section also stated that it was illegal to be a citizen of another country and a Member of Parliament. As a result, Green Senators Scott Ludnam and Larissa Waters would be forced to resign after realising that their New Zealand and Canadian citizenship made them eligible to sit in Parliament. Turnbull would criticise the Greens for not being acquainted with the Constitution before running, however he would soon end up eating those words when the real crisis began. Less than a month later, LNP Senator Matt Caravan revealed that he might have Italian citizenship. This was then followed by One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts, who was believed to have British citizenship. Soon dozens of members in both houses found their position in government in question due to technicalities in how other nations awarded citizenship. As a result, the High Court would begin the arduous task of investigating every member of Parliament born overseas or born to parents of immigrants. While Turnbull hoped for favourable results, the High Court soon declared that several members of both houses, including national leaders Barnaby Joyce, were eligible to sit in government and must step down immediately. This would be a total disaster for everyone in government, as several new senators would need to be sworn in, a lot of whom had been down ticket and had not expected to win a seat. Meanwhile, the lower house would need to hold a total of eight by-elections to re-elect the disqualified members, who now had revoked their citizenships. At this point, had any more members been disqualified, an election probably needs to have been called. Joyce would easily retain his seat of New England, but due to his disqualification had been replaced as leader by Michael McCormack. While the first three by-elections had seen the party hold in the seat retain it, attention would soon turn to the five by-elections being held on the 28th of July 2018, which soon came to be known as Super Saturday. Labour held onto four of these seats, while Xenophon candidate Rebecca Sharkey held the former Liberal seat of Mayo. Hoping to undermine Labour and its leader, Bill Shorten, Turnbull would choose to only contest Mayo and the two marginal seats of Longman and Braddon, while supporting third parties in Perth and Fremantle, with hopes of destabilising Labour going into next year's election. This ploy would end up failing, with Labour winning all four seats back with increased margin, and Sharkey holding on to Mayo. With Super Saturday showing swings against his party, Turnbull seemed destined to meet the same fate as Rudd in 2013, with a total defeat in the 2019 election. This would lead the Conservative faction of the Liberal Party to revolt, and the ground was set for yet another leadership spill. Since losing the Prime Ministership to Turnbull, Abbott had remained in Parliament and, like Rudd, wanted the top job back. But unlike Rudd, who had been deposed due to internal issues, 
Abbott had been deposed due to being highly unpopular, and thus knew he couldn't run for the PM position, and thus decided a political ideologue to step in for him. Enter Peter Dutton. Elected in 2001 for the seat of Dixon, Dutton had grown to prominence for his role of Minister for Immigration and Border Protection and later Home Affairs. In these roles, Dutton was responsible for the detainment of asylum seekers as well as the deportation of illegal residents. This led to accusations that Dutton was somewhat xenophobic and he would be despised by the more progressive communities in Australia. Regardless, Dutton would move to challenge Turnbull for the leadership in August 2018. This came after Turnbull had attempted to push a new climate policy to replace the carbon tax called the National Energy Guarantee, which was opposed by the Conservatives. Dutton initially failed to gain the votes, but within days Turnbull would resign following a party-wide petition denouncing his leadership. With Turnbull gone, Dutton would again move for the Prime Ministership. This terrified the more moderate faction of the party, who feared another Abbott figure becoming PM and destroying the Liberal Party's image. Thus, two figures would step up to challenge Dutton, Deputy Leader Julie Bishop and Treasurer Scott Morrison. Despite being the most popular of the three candidates, Bishop's supporters feared that she would lose to Dutton and thus backed Morrison, making the contest a two-way fight for the future of the Liberal Party. Morrison would emerge victorious with 45 votes to Dutton's 40, becoming the 30th Prime Minister of Australia. Born in 1968 Waverley, Sydney, Morrison would take on multiple careers during his early years before getting into the tourism industry in 1998. In 2004, he became Managing Director of Tourism Australia, where he would create the infamous So Where the Bloody Hell Are You? advertising campaign. Following this ad's poor reception, Morrison would leave Tourism Australia and enter Parliament winning the safe seat of Cook in 2007 from retiring member Bruce Bard. Following the 2013 election, Morrison would initially take over as Minister for Immigration and Border Protection before taking over as Treasurer following Turnbull's sacking of Joe Hockey. It was during this time that Morrison made a name for himself when he brought in a lump of coal to intimidate environmentalists in the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the Treasurer you. knows the rule on props. It's coal. It was dug up by men and women who work and live in the electorates of those who sit opposite. Following Morrison's unexpected rise into the Prime Minister's role, the Coalition found itself in a poor position, with the Labor Party now polling 10 points ahead on the two party preferred. Matters were made even worse when the resigning Turbo would be replaced by independent Karen Phelps, pushing the Coalition into its second minority government in under 10 years. With the government now in chaos, it seemed like history was repeating itself, with the 2019 election looking to be a repeat of the 2013 one. Government's position was made even more clear just months before the election when a bill was proposed allowing asylum seekers in island detention to come to the Australian mainland to seek medical attention. Despite the coalition opposing the bill, Labor and the crossbench were able to pass it regardless. This became the first major piece of legislation to pass the lower house without the government's permission since Stanley Bruce's arbitration and abolishment motion in 1929. With electoral defeat all but inevitable, Morrison would call the election for the 18th of May 2019 and would desperately try to regain the public support who saw the coalition as yet another failing government. With victory all but assured, Sean would begin to pivot his position from attacking the coalition to laying out what his government planned to do once they got into power. This was done to avoid the shock of the Abbott government brought in 2013 when they completely overhauled the previous Labour government's policies. This long list of policies would controversially contain major changes to franking credits, a cash refund to be given to pensioners for certain taxes taken out of their investments. This somewhat confusing policy would soon be picked up by Morrison who called it a retiree tax and would attack Labour for threatening the livelihoods of retired Australians. Meanwhile, third parties would attempt to yet again play off the chaos to gain support from disgruntled voters. Due to most third party senators just barely scraping into parliament in the 10th, 11th and 12th senate spots, the vast majority of seats up for grabs this election would be those of third parties, and with the high threshold to stay in, third parties would face challenges. In South Australia, the Xenophon team, now renamed Central Alliance, would face challenges following a disastrous result in the 2018 South Australian state election, which saw a humiliated Xenophon leave politics. Meanwhile in Queensland, Clive Palmer looked to make a comeback following his departure in 2016. Re-engaging his United Australia party, Palmer would begin a giant 60 million election campaign with hopes of getting himself elected into the Senate. As election day approached, attention would soon turn towards the Carmichael coal mine in northern Queensland. The government planned to allow the mine's owner, Adani, to undertake a massive expansion project to boost its output. 
This came in the face of a massive environmental protest due to the lack of action being taken on climate change by the coalition. As a result, former Greens leader Bob Brown would lead a convoy of protesters up along the Queensland coast to protest the mine in what became known as the Stop Adani movement. This movement would be joined by GetUp, who began to run targeted attack ads at anti-environmental coalition members such as Abbott and Dutton, with hopes of deposing them from their seats. And the winner was... As counting began, the Labour Party's hopes of forming government quickly began to fade, as the swing against the government in New South Wales and Victoria looked to be minimal. Worse, the government was getting large swings towards it in Queensland and Tasmania. Labour hoped for a turnaround when the Western Australian results came in, but by the end of the night it was clear that the coalition had held on to power, with Scott Morrison winning 77 seats, a gain of one from the last election, along with 51.53% of the two party preferred. These seats included Longman and Braddon, which the coalition had failed to win on Super Saturday. In his victory speech, Scott Morrison would go on to say, I have always believed in miracles. <laughs> the Labour Party had been gobsmacked. After dominating the polls going into the election, with the government in utter chaos, to face defeat seemed unbelievable. While Shorten had retained 68 seats for the party, a lot of those seats now sat on razor-thin margins backed up by third-party preferences as the party's first preference count dropped to its lowest point since 1931, with only a third of Australians putting Labour as their first choice. If Labour could take away one small victory from this election, it would be the ousting of Tony Abbott, who, due to a strong campaign pushed by Get Up, would lose his seat of Warringah to former Olympiad Sally Stegall. With the election still being somewhat recent, the reasons for the coalition's upset win is still being debated. One factor that helped the coalition in this election was the fact that unlike his predecessor, Morrison had not been the one responsible for taking down Turnbull. This meant Morrison lacked any of the bad image, which came with the leadership power struggles. Meanwhile, a lot of blame has been aimed at Labour's large policy proposals, which left the party open for attacks on multiple angles. This included franking credits, whose confusing nature was easily attacked as a retiree tax, despite not being such. Shorten himself had also been blamed for the loss, as even during the coalition's turbulent leadership spills, he had never been particularly popular due to his aggressive tone and role as the factional heavyweight behind both Rudd and Gillard's demise. Others have taken notice of the relation between support for Palmer United and the coalition's swings, with Palmer prefacing the coalition on all his ballots. Despite failing to win any seats, Palmer would come out the day after the election and admit that he had hoped the coalition would win, despite strongly campaigning against both parties in the lead up to the election. As a result, accusations would soon arise that Palmer had spent $60 million on getting the coalition elected over himself. While Morrison's gains in the loyal house would be small, he had finally achieved what his two predecessors could not, and had drastically shrunk the Senate crossbench down from 20 to 15 members, with the coalition picking up all five of the seats. While Ambie and the Greens would hold on to their seats, the other parties would not be so lucky and would either lose seats or be completely wiped out of the Senate. As a result, the crossbench's power in government had been drastically weakened, and the government found itself only requiring minimal support to pass legislation. Some have compared the 2019 election to the US 2016 election, where the Conservative Party would defy the polls to win. However, a much more accurate analysis would be to compare this election with Keating's 1993 win, in which a failing government was able to defy the odds by scaring the public away from the opposition, pushing ambitious policies. However, despite the so-called miracle win, the coalition still only had a narrow two-seat majority in the lower house. Worse, their first preference count had gone backwards. Was this another 1993 election in which a failing government was able to defy the polls before a massive crash? Well, we don't know yet, as, as of this video's recording, the next election hasn't happened. So, come back next time for what I presume is the election of 2022.